The text for this morning's sermon is Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Now, when Jesus heard this, that this is about the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. This is the good news. If you follow the news, you know that soon our congressional leaders will be negotiating a federal budget again. And whenever such negotiations take place, the numbers that we hear or read about are astonishing in size. They talk about trillions of dollars. And of course, we all know how to write such numbers down on paper, and then we can stare at them. But how can we make human sense of such huge numbers? If you can visualize one million dollars, here's a comparison that should give you some idea about the size of a trillion. If you had started spending one million dollars every single day since Jesus was born, you still wouldn't have spent a trillion dollars by today. Another numbers person explains it like this. One million seconds is about 11 and a half days. One billion seconds is about 32 years, while a trillion seconds is equal to 32,000 years. We are bombarded with big numbers these days. For example, how many worldwide have been affected by the coronavirus? How many deaths have there been? The World Health Organization reports that over 770 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been contracted worldwide with nearly 7 million deaths. Well, those are staggering numbers. How can we look beyond the big numbers and put a human face on such a tragedy. Seeking to give a human face to the statistics during the worst of the pandemic, you may recall that some newspapers and television news shows each week featured the lives of some of the people, some of our neighbors who had succumbed to the virus. And they would tell a bit of their story and perhaps show a picture or two This was an important effort because when we hear big numbers, we can't often take it in, and we must not think of crowds. We need to see the human faces behind the numbers. Jesus lived in a culture where there was no health care coverage and no social safety net to speak of. Large segments of the population were in desperate need constantly. Five times in our short scripture passage today, Matthew mentions the crowds. But Matthew shows us how Jesus stood before a crowd and yet he encountered humanity. In verse 14 we read, When he went ashore, Jesus saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. Jesus saw a great crowd that day, but he looked into the crowd with compassion. 
and saw the faces of women and men and boys and girls in need. Sometimes we look out on our neighborhoods, but we do not see the neighbors. Christ calls us to see beyond the statistics and to look on each other with compassion. During the years when I served at the American Baptist Home Mission Societies, I used to provide demographic studies to churches that were interested in learning more about their neighborhoods. And we would provide these studies, especially when a church was looking for a new pastor as a tool to help the church get some language to describe the surrounding community to pastoral candidates. And an area minister at a denominational meeting once told me how one church that he served had been helped by this information. The congregation had told him they thought they saw increasing numbers of children and they tried to discuss this with their pastor. How can we reach out to these children, they wondered. Now it was clear that the pastor was about to retire and he didn't want to start anything new. So he assured these folks each time that the subject came up that there really were no significant number of children. And then he retired and the church members received the demographic report from my office and they studied it and excited by what they saw in those numbers, they said to their area minister, we knew we saw children. And so looking beyond the numbers to the children that they represented, that congregation began a new ministry. Those church members saw a great crowd and had compassion for them. And they were reminded that the pastor is not always the first one to see the possibilities for ministry. Our text tells us that confronted with the news of John the Baptist's death at the hands of King Herod, Jesus sought some quiet time away from it all. And so he withdrew from the spotlight. But human needs seemed to follow him wherever he went. Verse 13 says, Now when Jesus heard this news about John the Baptist's death, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Jesus' destination was not a deserted place for long that day. Jesus' need for solitude at that moment of loss collided with the desperate needs of the people around him. Matthew's gospel tells us that Jesus began to heal them. In that culture with high unemployment and no safety net, the need for health care was urgent. And so the hours must have passed as Jesus dealt with one physical need after the next until finally the disciples tried to get him to wrap it up. We can surely understand when the disciples suggested to Jesus that he send the crowd away to find their own food. And I imagine that the disciples must have been confused and perhaps annoyed when Jesus turned instead and said to them, they don't have to go away, you give them something to eat. Their response was understandable. Five loaves and two fish were not even enough to feed the disciples at that moment. And so in so many words, they're saying, we don't have the resources, Jesus. We're not set up for this. But Jesus started where they were and he used what they had at hand rather than supplying them with money. Okay, I understand that you don't have a truckload of food on hand, he seemed to be saying, but what do you have? We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish, they responded. How pathetic is that? Here the enormous size of the great crowd confronts the tiny, meager resources of the early church represented by those 12 disciples. And yet somehow that very little is what Christ used to feed a hungry crowd that evening. Bread for the World reports that more than 700 million people worldwide experience hunger every day. 
And in 45 countries, more than 50 million people are facing emergency levels of hunger, struggling to live in the face of famine. And we know that hunger also exists in our own country, not because there's a shortage of food, but here the overwhelming cause of hunger is poverty. In the United States, where there's poverty, hunger is often there also. In developing countries, hunger is related to poverty and to underdeveloped agriculture. And where there's bad health and weather changes and natural disasters and war, hunger can also be found. Hunger results from the displacement caused by war and unstable or unavailable markets and from waste. Like the disciples that day with their little bit of bread and fish, many churches have made consistent efforts at feeding the neighbors in need. Calvary Baptist Church in Norristown for many years ran a soup kitchen every Monday at noon. And during the worst of the pandemic, when it was no longer safe to sit at the table with the people coming in for the lunch, lunches were still prepared and distributed at the door. This church has been helping to alleviate poverty through the food cupboard ministry, even during the worst of the pandemic. And the problem of domestic hunger has only grown more insistent these past few years. What can we do in the face of such overwhelming need? Like the disciples, we must present what little we have to be blessed in Christ's service. And then we offer that little bit, not to the whole crowd at once, but now to one face in the crowd, now to another, one or two at a time. But it's not only the physical needs of those around us that can seem overwhelming to the church. When we look at the changes experienced by congregations in this country over the past few decades, we realize that we are in the midst of a vast change to religious life in America. According to the Pew Research Center, when asked about their religious identification, now more Americans than ever say that they have none. With our limited resources, how can we even begin to dig into a problem as immense as this? When I have a large writing assignment for Judson Press, I sometimes feel overwhelmed when I think about all the words I have to write. Where should I begin? And you know, that question for a writer can lead to writer's block, where actually nothing at all gets written. And I have learned to just start writing something, getting words, imperfect words at that, written down. And so I tell myself, write a little, and then write some more. I have learned not to try to deal with the whole crowd of words that confront me. I just begin with a few words and then a few more. In my imagination, I see the disciples taking the first small step into the crowd that day with their meager supply of bread and fish. And then they took the next step, and then the next. And at each step, they had no more than just enough for that one moment. You know, this is the only one of Jesus' miracles that is reported in all four Gospels. And it began with the skeptical disciples presenting what little they had to Jesus for blessing. We read, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And our text tells us that at the end of the day, all ate and were filled. In fact, 12 baskets of leftovers were gathered. Well, whatever lay at the root of this story, it certainly made a profound impression on those followers of Jesus. Some people read this story and they think of that folksy legend of stone soup. 
where the real miracle was in getting the crowd to share what they had with each other. It was something like a church pot luck, they imagined. Knowing what we know about human behavior, that certainly would have been no less a miracle. But it seems to me that the greater miracle was getting the skeptical disciples to present what little they had for blessing in service, to look beyond the need of that great crowd and their own woefully inadequate resources. The key movement was when they stepped out in obedience to Christ's challenge, you give them something to eat. That word is a word spoken to us again today, even as we may feel that our resources as a church are inadequate for the growing and changing needs around us. You give them something to eat. The disciples objected that they didn't have near enough to make any real impact, just five loaves and two fish. But Jesus said, bring them here to me. Jesus' words to those disciples can be a word to us today. You give them something to eat. Let us not get lost or confused by the big numbers that we see in the news each day. Christian, how many loaves have you? Baptist Church in the Great Valley, how many loaves have you? Whatever may be the number, we know it is not nearly enough for the great human need that surround us today. But let us listen for Jesus' word spoken to all his disciples down through the ages. You give them something to eat. From whatever you have, however meager it seems, however inadequate it is to meet the crushing human need and the big changes in the world swirling around us, bring what little you have to me and you give them something to eat. Amen.